the next presentation is the structure tools, Lyra and Scepter. So there was some interest yesterday and we said we reserved that for our specialized presentations for today. This is presented uh, by Paolo Marcutilli, uh, who is our collaborator at the Denmark Technical University. And unfortunately, Paolo could not be with us today uh, live in person, but um, luckily we do have his presentation um, pre-recorded and it's, it's still very much relevant as it was at last year's workshop. So we'll be playing, pay, playing that for you now. Um, feel free to still submit some questions. Um, there will be an opportunity to answer some of those. Um, Bjorn is very kindly joining Marcus for the Q&A. So um, with that, I will share my screen now and get this playing for you. Hello everyone, uh, I'm Paolo, I'm from uh, Denmark, uh, working at DTU, uh, Technical University of Denmark, uh, on antibody and T-cell receptor structure mainly. And today we'll be presenting two tools that are Lyra and Scepter that are uh, connected to retrieving and modeling antibody and T-cell receptor structures. Uh, you can uh, get access to these tools by the uh, IDB page through those links, T-cell tools and B-cell tools. Here they are. And uh, uh, I will start talking about SEPTER. The main idea is that uh, we are starting to have uh, quite a few, um, quite a large number of T-cell and B-cell receptor uh, structures available. In the first tool that I will be presenting that it's scepter, it's a tool that is used to retrieve and uh, um, uh, filter these, uh, these uh, experimental structures. Uh, why we need to do that? So first of all, uh, very often these kind of, uh, of resources, uh, the, main, uh, the main database that we use to get access to salt structures is the PDB, is the uh, protein data bank, uh, are, are updated uh, uh, with, with a very high frequency. So we want to get databases that are, or data sets that are updated uh, uh, in, a, in an easy way. Uh, but also we want to get some control over the structures that we retrieve. So we want to have a given quality uh, of the structure, we want to be able to uh, uh, to, to uh, get structures of uh, different antibodies and T-cell receptors, and that's why we need tools to uh, automatically uh, retrieve those structures. And uh, uh, the way we um, uh, we filter structures is based on the antibody and T-cell receptor specifics, um, meaning that uh, the the uh, way we want to be able to filter them is not based on the on the overall sequence, but it's based on specific regions. Uh, you all know, I mean, the the, the, the overall antibody and T-cell receptor structure. We have here a picture describing uh, the, the structure itself. Here we have a T-cell receptor in gray. In light gray, we have the alpha chain, and in dark gray, we have the beta chain interacting with a peptide MHC complex. This is a, a class uh, one uh, uh, MHC in which we have a, an alpha chain and a beta two microglobulin presenting a peptide here in the middle in orange. And you see that you have very specific regions of the T cell receptor that, that interact with the MHC and the, with the peptide. If we zoom in, uh, on the, on the T-cell receptor, and I'm looking here at the right, we can see that the interaction is mainly driven by these six loops that are colored in shades of blue and the red, that are uh, the so-called CDR loops, complementary to determining regions. We have three on the alpha and three on the beta, and uh, similarly, we have uh, uh, three CDR on the light chain and uh, three CDR on the uh, heavy chain for antibodies. These six loops are the ones that give the specificity. So you have a pretty much conserved structure uh, all over the place, but these six loops are extremely variable in sequence and to some extent also in structure. So whenever we want to create a set of structures, we really want to focus on CDR loops because those are the ones that really uh, are important 
put a function. Um, why we need some tool to filter things? Uh, well, why I need this kind of tools? So I can tell you why I am always using this kind of tools is that we uh, want to develop statistical models or machine learning models for predicting the behavior of antibodies and these receptors. So we want to have a way to understand the specificity by looking at available data. And uh, one of the problem is that, uh, first of all, you need to be able to filter out uh, experimental data of low quality. So you, you need to have a way to, uh, to only retrieve data of good quality. But also, and this is a major problem when you develop computational tools, you want to be able to uh, control redundancy. Uh, if, if you work with antibodies and these are receptors, you know that uh, there is a, a large number of structures for a very uh, little number of cases. So for example, COVID or HIV, uh, they, they we have plenty of antibodies and these are receptor for these cases, but maybe we have very few for other epitopes. So we want to be able to uh, control that. Redundancy is, is in general not a good thing in, uh, in data sets, and especially when you uh, want to develop models, redundancy has a major impact. It can cause one thing that is called overfitting, meaning that our model will not be able to uh, predict nicely on all cases. And in general, if you want to understand or to compare your own uh, sequences of antibodies and this receptor, and to see if there are structures available, you want to be able to have a unbiased of a view or of uh, similar uh, uh, sequences. Uh, this is why we need this kind of tool. Just to give you an example from uh, from the ADP, uh, if we look at, at CDR three sequences of uh, beta chain of TCR that are ta uh, targeting this peptide GLC TL DAML. We can see that there are plenty of TCRs that are very similar, meaning meaning that they are CDR three. It's almost identical with uh, one or two mutations. And this is way also. This is true also the other way around. So we can have cases in which uh, we have that a single TCR binds to peptides that are quite similar. So we want to be able to uh, take these things in, into consideration. That's why we need a tool like SEPTA. This is the main interface of SEPTA. We'll start with the uh, with interface, uh, with the first page in order to retrieve TCR uh, structures. And uh, um, as you can see, this is a, you have a number of fields that you can use to filter. Uh, and and the main idea is that, as I was mentioning, you have two main goals: to uh, keep a given level of quality for your structures, and to um, be sure that you don't have a bias in your data sets to, to keep a given level of redundancy. The first part, that is the first three fields uh, in the upper side of the form are connected to the experimental quality. Uh, most of the structure are X-ray structures. So uh, we have that the main um, parameters that we can use to, uh, to, to filter the quality are the resolution, the R3 and the missing residues. If we think at a, uh, at a crystallographic structure, um, as an analogy, uh, as if it were a picture, the resolution is actually the resolution of the picture, the amount of information that we have. So um, the lower the number here, so uh, one, for example, it means one angstrom, that it's a measure of the resolution, the uh, larger the amount of uh, data that we have. So it's a, it's a finer, it's a, it's a finer, yes, picture of the, of the structure. On the other hand, the R3 is a measure of the noise that is present. So how well the structure that we have in the PTP uh, is actually uh, um, fits with the experimental data. And in this case, again, the lower the number, the better the quality. Finally, we have 
the fact that we want or not to include TCR or, or in general molecules with missing races in, in the CDR. And this is again connected to the experiment. In some cases, there are residues that are invisible in, uh, in crystallographies just because, for example, they are flexible and they move too much. So they are out of focus in the picture, let's say. And in general, we don't want to include those to be on the safe side, but there might be cases in which you actually want to have a larger data set and also include those. So again, resolution, the lower the better. Uh, and, and the default is treat that it's a um, kind of a good compromise between amount of, of structures that you can retrieve and quality. They are free, uh, the lower the better, and the missing residues. The second part is about the type of molecule that you want to retrieve. And you have the first um, drop down menu that allows you to, to select between peptidic, epitopes, and non peptidic. The vast majority, of course, are peptides, uh, the type of epitopes that most of the classical MHC bind. Uh, but of course, there are also a, a few structures of non peptidic epitopes. If you select peptidic, um, then you have the option to filter on uh, the peptide itself. You can filter on the uh, length of the epitope. You can filter on the, on the redundancy. So uh, you can kind of uh, uh, cluster together structures that bind in which the TCR binds to very similar peptides. And you can cluster on the binding core of the epitope or on the extended region of, of the epitope. This is mostly important for class two in which you have that the, the, the binding part, the, the, the region in which the epitope binds uh, to the uh, MHC, it's, a, it's just a smaller region of the complete peptide. And uh, uh, the sequence identity is really important. Uh, why is that? Because we know that, for example, when we, we develop models for TCR specificity, uh, those models are usually quite good at uh, predicting uh, specificity to peptides that are very similar or identical to the peptides that we have in data sets. And they are less good when we move farther from that. So it's a good way to understand the data that we're looking at and how well we can uh, have rules or, or analysis that generalize to um, many different peptides. Uh, finally, you can also filter on the organism that it's uh, um, yeah, the source organism and the type of uh, MHC, class one or class two. Then you press submit and you have an output page that is like this, in which you have plenty of information and this is a kind of type of table that you have seen uh, several times. Uh, the specificity here is that since you can cluster by identity, the first column that it's named cluster um, is giving you an identifier of uh, a number of structures that fit with the criteria that you have selected. So in this cases, you have a cluster ID that it starts with a uh, first number that is connected to the epitope. Then you have two numbers that are connected to the alpha and beta chain. And then you have finally some numbers that are, or numbers and letters that are connected to the MHC. Um, and as you can see, for example, in this case, you have four and four is connected to the epitope that is GIL. Uh, then you have A1B1 connected to the alpha and beta chain of the TCR. And then you have A1 that is connected to the MHC. Uh, if you, filter the epitope at lower sequence identity, several different peptides will, will fall into a single cluster. Then you have uh, uh, other columns that link to IDB pages with, the, with more information about this specific sample. They link to the epitope ID and to the receptor ID. Uh, you have also links, internal and external links to uh, actually visualize the structure. 
uh, either by going to this view 3D structure that will open a new uh, tab or a new page uh, to, to visualize actually the complex the uh, TCR and the um, MHC with the peptide. You can also play around and uh, visualize interaction of specific region, or you can open uh, the, the, the external link to the PDB with the original data. And uh, yes, you can download the results with the with the link that it's up there with download results. And basically the same is true for other pages. Uh, so for example, if you want to retrieve MHC uh, complexes bound to uh, peptides, you have more or less the same interface with resolution and are free. Again, you can select peptidic or non-peptidic. Again, you can filter on the length and uh, filter on the organism and MHC class. And the output page is more or less the same. In this case, we uh, don't have information about the CCR because you might have structures in which the peptide is bound to the MHC, but there's no TCR uh, in the complex. Again, the same is true for, uh, for uh, antibodies in the BCR, b cell receptor tab. You can filter on the same parameters. In this case, there's a small difference in which, um, again, peptidic and non-peptidic. Peptidic in this case means that it's uh, either, if it's peptidic, is it, uh, the, the antigen is either a peptide or protein. If it's non-peptidic, it might be a small molecule or some other kind of molecule that it's not a protein. Uh, and you can filter on the antigen length. And in this case, if it's, a, if it's less than 50, it's typically a peptide. If it's 50, 60 or more, it's a protein. And more or less the same things that I've uh, described before apply uh, to this output page. Now, uh, of course, this is a very useful resource, but uh, the amount of structures that we have in the PDP, the amount of experimentally solved structure is, is pretty minute if we think about the uh, great diversity that we have in the T cell receptor and B cell receptor repertoire. So what if the molecules that we want to analyze are not in the PDP? And, and just to give you an idea, we have at the current time approximately 2,000, 2,500 antibody structures and uh, probably a few hundred, 300 or 400 T cell receptor structures. If you think about the diversity you can generate in a repertoire, this is a very minute number of, of structures. Does this mean that if there's no structure available, I mean, we cannot include structure analysis in our, uh, um, in our uh, work? This is not the case because uh, luckily we have very uh, accurate tools to predict the structure of T-cell receptor and B-cell receptor. And this is uh, the other tool that I'm going to present that is uh, uh, LIRA. Uh, LIRA, that is uh, the acronym for lympho uh, Lymphocyte Receptor Automated Modeling, is a very simple tool to uh, model the structure of antibodies and T-cell receptor to a very high accuracy. And the, the main concept here is that when you do a standard, let's say old school modeling of, of structures, uh, I'm saying old school because we all know that now AlphaFold has kind of re revolutionized the, the field of uh, structural modeling. But in general, when you model the uh, proteins, your model is, uh, the quality of your model is constrained by the quality and the availability of similar proteins uh, that have been um, experimentally solved. So in general, if you have regions in your protein that are very similar to something that has been solved, then your model will be good. And uh, if there's no similar structure, no similar sequence, then the model will be less accurate. But in the case of uh, uh, T cell receptor antibodies, the part that is less similar, that is the, uh, that the CDR loops, is actually the part that is responsible for the specificity. So you can have a very good model for the conserved framework regions. 
And then you would have a less reliable model in the, in the CDR loops. And this is really undesirable because your model would be uh, almost unuseful. But luckily in the, in the 80s, um, uh, Cyrus Chodia and Arthur Lesk uh, uh, discovered that the sequence variability of antibodies and this receptor in the CDR region does not directly mean that they have a huge structural variability. And they created this uh, theory or this, uh, this uh, protocol, this is called a canonical structure protocol. That means that you can actually predict the structure of the CDRs to a very accuracy in, a, in, in the vast majority of cases. And this uh, uh, important discovery has uh, generated a way to create antibody and T-cell receptor model, models that it's uh, highly accurate. The main idea is that uh, you can actually exploit uh, this uh, limited variability of the CDR to uh, create accurate models for the, for the complete structure. This is the main page for, for LIRA in which you have two uh, text areas in which you will uh, just copy and paste the sequence of the light and heavy chain or the sequence of the alpha and beta chain, it works both for antibodies and T-cell receptor. It doesn't matter the order in which you put the two. It's important that you put amino acidic sequences uh, or with or without the header. So either in pasta format or in pure text format. And, uh, and then the, the tool, uh, if you don't want to, to go into details, can work without any additional parameter. And the main idea is that the framework regions, that is everything that is not the CDR region is modeled by homology. So by identifying similar structures in the PDP. For the CDR, the tool will first identify what is the canonical structure. So the overall shape of the CDR and then identify a template within that specific class. So a template that is known to belong to that specific, to, to, to have that spe specific shape for that specific loop. So um, yes, you just upload the sequences as you see, it can either be in fast or plain text. In case you need, there is an advanced option um, tab and you uh, can select basically a few more um, advanced parameters, mainly related to the modeling of side chain. As you know, uh, the, the proteins are, um, or in general amino acids, are composed by um, backbone or main chain and a side chain. And uh, in general, the modeling is, is accurate for the backbone and is less accurate for the side chain. So if in, in specific cases, you might want to play around with these. And the main idea is that here you can use uh, the default mm, method um, that is uh, used by Lara is to copy the side chain of residues that are identical in the template and in our target protein and to model the ones that are different using a tool that is called Scurl, that it's a um, uh, side chain modeling tool developed by Roland Dumbrecht. You can also uh, decide to exclude specific PDB structures or experimental structure from the modeling protocol. And this is usually, uh, uh, let's say, uh, this is something that you can use either if you want to benchmark your tool. So you predict a new structure uh, um, that has just recently been solved and you want to see how good you can perform, you blacklist that specific structure so that it's not included in the modeling. And then you can basically uh, assess the accuracy of the modeling protocol. Or if you know that a specific structure has some feature that it's undesirable, for example, it has uh, uh, mutations that have been introduced or it has uh, a quality that is not satisfactory, you can actually blacklist that just by writing the PDB code for that specific structure. You submit and the output page looks like this. You have several tabs in the first tab that is result. Uh, you just get uh, yeah, your input data. 
then you can get uh, an idea of the alignment here. These two are the alignment of the uh, light chain and the machine, your, temp your input sequences and the template sequences that are being used to, to model that. And in the upper table, you see the actual templates that have been used to model the framework of the two chains and each individual CDR loop. And as you can see, you can use multiple templates up to nine to produce a single model. Then you can visualize your structure uh, as before. You can uh, uh, color different regions in a different way. And to give you some like rough estimate of the accuracy, uh, in this plot, we, we show the accuracy for B cell receptors and T cell receptors, antibodies and T cell receptors. For antibodies, each column is representing a different region, L1, L2, L3, uh, all the loops and the framework. And here is the average accuracy, the average Hermesby, meaning how far away is the predicted model to the real structure. Uh, this is done in a blind uh, assessment in which the specific structure has been removed and then predicted uh, using all the rest of the data. And as, as a general uh, uh, assessment, you can see that you get a, an accuracy of the overall framework that is less than one angstrom. Uh, and for each loop in general, that it's below or approximately one angstrom. And the green bar shows the, uh, the ratio or the fraction of, of models that are of extremely good quality. And then up to red in which you have red and black uh, that are poor and very poor quality. And you see that basically around 80, 90% of the structure are, are of very good quality and the green uh, region is uh, showing qualities that are almost as good as, as the experimental quality. Uh, this is also true for TCR, less than, than antibodies. So the quality of TCR receptor models is slightly lower than antibodies just because the number of templates, the number of salt structures for TCR, receptor, TCR receptors is lower. And the exception is the CDR3 of uh, the alpha and beta and light and heavy. Uh, this is still, the quality of these two loops is still lower because they are more variable. They also, their structure is more variable. So we have a slightly lower quality for these regions. But again, we envision that with the new uh, tools that are available to model structure like AlphaFold and other tools connected to, uh, to these, um, to these uh, deep learning methods, uh, the numbers, the accuracy of the H3 or CDR3 in general will, will increase in the next few years. Why is this important? And I'll quickly give you, um, let's say, uh, an overview of what you can use this for. Uh, in, in, we have also developed a, a DTU tools to, to predict the structure of complete T cell receptor peptide MHC complexes and uh, uh, and we have shown that one can actually use these uh, uh, models to improve uh, the prediction of specificity for T cell receptor. So uh, if you model the structure of a, of a complex TCR PMHC complex, and you put it together using, for example, the TCR PMHC tool that we have developed a few years back, and then you use computational force field to measure the, uh, uh, the interactions uh, between the T cell receptor and the peptide MHC complex, these uh, predicted uh, uh, energy that you get from the force field can actually improve, uh, help you to identify what is the right epitope that a given TCR binds. Uh, we have used this uh, force field and the force field that we use are uh, Rosetta and Feldex force field to try and pair together a given TCR with the corresponding peptide. And we see that we can actually uh, use the force field and, and uh, tweak it and, and fine tune it to be able to recognize to a some extent the interaction between TCR and PMHC. 
it's important to underline that this uh, prediction, of course, is based on a structural model in the, uh, in the computational force field. So it's not very precise. But the good thing is that if we uh, use this uh, as a extra information to identify, for example, which TCR binds to a given uh, peptide, yeah, so we want to pair a given TCR to a very specific peptide MSC complex. The most naive thing that we can do is just to use the MHC binding affinity and to say, okay, uh, we just predict uh, uh, the, the, the specificity based on the MHC peptide binding alone. And in general, we get good results because the MHC is actually the, the MHC binding is the, the most uh, discriminative uh, part of everything. Um, but if you, oh, sorry, if you also include the information about the uh, binding energy between the TCR and the, the PMHC, you can actually slightly improve the prediction. So uh, here on the left, we are only using information about the TCR binding from the uh, models that we generated. On the right, we're only using MHC binding. If we mix the two, we can improve the performance. And this has been uh, uh, kind of included in uh, different pipelines. For example, in pipelines for rational epitope discovery or to, to design uh, antibodies, uh, therapeutic antibodies and this receptor. And the main idea is that you can use these to generate models, to analyze the interaction, and then to uh, propose mutations to the antibody or to the T cell receptor to increase the affinity to perform experiments and then uh, in an in a, yeah, iterative way to improve uh, your, um, your molecules. So to sum it up, um, I presented today these two tools, uh, SEPTER that gives you access to PDB structures, to uh, experimentally sold structures of BSA receptor and TSA receptor, and allows you to create customized data set with a given quality and given redundancy. And then Lyra, that is a tool that you can use to model TSA receptor and BSA receptor uh, with a high accuracy. And uh, this can be used to perform a certain large number of downstream analysis. And that being said, um, yeah, I finished with my presentation and I uh, leave the word to Nina. At this point, I would like to re-invite Marcus to the virtual stage to start uh, tackling some questions. And I'd also like to invite Bjorn, um, who will be covering the structure tools questions on behalf of Paolo. Marcus, would you like to take the first question? Uh, yes. So first question is from Mauricio. So is there any creation before retrieving the 3D models from AlphaFold protein structure database? It's been discussed. Some of the models from this database are not good, probably because of the low coverage with the experimentally determined structure. And this is a really good question. Thanks for asking that. But yeah, there's no creation. The, we are doing just automatically. Uh, but I'm going to share my screen really quickly so you can see uh so you can see we have the label here so i just open a top there's alpha for uh, uh model uh agent for that laptop and it, now you can see it's highlighted here the laptop but you can see the color legends here you can see if that laptop is inside of a like a a, a better score region or like a low score so uh if you suffer like a, a, a in if that laptop is mapping on like in origin part of the 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 the, the, uh, the structure uh it is i would say not take that as like a good one because of uh just very low score is like uh it means that probably that uh it is wrong model that that, that region of the protein but yes so well, thanks for your question so uh can you change let me stop sharing can you Oh, do you want to say something, Bjorn? I was just thinking you could uh, demo how to do the downloads uh, there as well as, as you had the window share, but never mind. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, 
do, uh, can I go? Like, can I go? Please go. Questions? Yes. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Go ahead. Can you change the uh, view similar to other structures program and stick ball surface? Okay. Uh, only for the, uh, if you're using the Aptop tab. So if you click on the, on the Aptop, the previous search from the Aptop, you can change that. But for the monument browser and also for the, the, the essays, you cannot change. We hide that, that common line, that common menu because uh, could, for example, for especially for the monument browser, it could be uh, if you change the layout, can be messy with the response frequency uh, uh, coloring. So you just, you know, just disable for, so, so the user cannot change the, 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 the style of, of the, the crystal or of a folder. Good. Done. Okay, but let me do. Sure. Yeah, let me do one question from Mario Ostrovsky on the immunum browser. How do you know what kind of response it is? T cell or antibody, or does it state this somewhere? So essentially, what the immunum browser shows is always the result of your query. So you can query for specifically T cell responses or antibodies. You can further query for say only seeing things that are recognized uh, by humans or you could query for uh, um, uh, antibody responses that are found to be neutralizing or so. So, so uh, what, what based on what you query, that gives you the set of epitopes that is then mapped uh, to the um, antigen and that's what's being displayed. Um, yeah, and it's obviously that's important to keep in mind. And also keep in mind, if you just uh, if you do the entire query, you'll have antibodies and uh, T cell uh, responses there and it's gonna be very confusing. Um, I mean, are very hard to interpret what what that means. So um, yeah, so the user obviously has to know what they're doing. Uh, okay, as Marie, so uh, in respect to visualization of context between P and T and T cell residues, why are the cutoff being used? Can the user change the cutoff? The cutoff is uh, any residues uh, with the the range of four angstrom of uh, distancing. It is uh, it is measured as like a that in contact with the other residue. So this is the cutoff is for angstrom of distancing. Uh, right now the user cannot change that, but uh, I see it really has the, the option but on, on its built-in options, they calculated uh, that. So maybe we, we can like also uh, have these options so the user can use it for calculated context from our Ratio system, or maybe for the ic 3 d but this is something like we need to discuss. But right now, we cannot change that. We're going to use it all the what is available on the ITV. And there's one more question, Marcus. I was wondering, can you can you demo how to do uh, downloads of 3D structures? Uh, 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 <laughs> you, I'm oh. probably going to need some guide because I can't okay. <laughs> so, so I think we might answer this later then. So, so I mean, the, the whole uh, viewer is based on the ICN 3D system and that has, but I also forgot how to do it. Uh, so, the, um, so it is possible, <laughs> um, but that needs to be, um, yeah, we need to uh, look it up. I mean, uh, I, uh, being the barbarian that I am, I typically just uh, do a screenshot of my screen <laughs> and, and use that. But obviously, for high resolution, that's that's not good. Um, and in general, I, I think the uh, we probably should be making the ICN 3D base functionality a little bit more apparent where it is. Um, so yeah, I hope that answers it. I'm so, yeah, sorry. Thank you. And I think that's the questions we had. <laughs>